Ray swore an oath to God to protect his name, his followers, and his kingdom. The military orders of the Crusades answered the call when threat of annihilation was hanging in the balance. In an all-new series, James and Joanna Bogle discuss the heroic efforts of the defense of ancient Christendom. You know, Europe is attacked from the north, from the south, from the east, uh, from, you know, and from the north, northeast as well. We really, literally had attacks on all sides. So arose the military orders and the Crusades, an all-new series here on the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. And welcome to the Military Orders and the Crusades. Today we're going to look at the Muslim threat to the holy places and the threat to Christendom. I'm Joanna Bogle and I'm with my husband, Jamie. Well, last time we seemed to leave things at the Battle of Tours and Charles Martel, so we perhaps we'd better backtrack on that as today we're going to explore the Islamic threat to the holy places. And we're still before the year 1000 AD. We're still before the Norman conquest of Britain and so on. We're back in that era. Well, that's right. 732 was the Battle of Tours. 722 in Spain, the Battle of Cobadonga, the first successful battle by the, the Christians against Islam. But as, I, as we said last time, Islam didn't, wasn't stopped by that. It pushed on right their way up to northern France, to Tours, where Charles Martel... Uh, the, the then king of the Franks uh, subsequently uh, they became France uh, the, 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 the French uh, defeated uh, an army of, of, of very significant army in size uh, of uh, Muslim raiders under Abdul Rahman al Ghafiqi and he did so it is said with only 1500 soldiers uh, or knights and you saw from the quote that we had from Edward Gibbon the sceptical, anti-Christian, secular uh, historian of the 18th century, uh, that he himself uh, was of the view, uh, as was really very common amongst uh, historians and probably still is, that but for that battle, Islam probably wouldn't have been stopped, would have pressed on to take over perhaps the whole of the of then Christian Europe and Christianity would accordingly have been reduced to a very small rump. But Charles Martel, the grandfather of the great Emperor Charlemagne, uh, managed to uh, prevent that from happening. It was around about this time that we start to see uh, divisions within the Muslim Empire, by now stretching through all of Mesopotamia, parts of India, all of northern Africa, Spain, threatening constantly Constantinople. Uh, and it's a huge empire. Um, but it begins to start to have, as empires so often do, internal battles, w dynastic wars or uh, conflicts within, within uh, the core of Islam. And we see in 750 the Abbasid dynasty taking control of most of the Muslim world, except for Spain, which remains under the original uh, caliphate family, the um Umayyads. And uh, the Abbasids who take over uh, again move the capital of uh, the Islamic world which had been moved from uh, uh, Mecca to Damascus it now gets moved to Baghdad in what was once Christian Iraq um, and uh, the, the Abbasid Caliphate based thereon remains in the supreme office uh, ruling uh, that part of the Islamic world right up until about 1258 when the Turks begin to take over uh, meanwhile, in Spain, where the uh, Umayyad dynasty still holds sway, we see Ab the famous Abdul Rahman, um, the, the caliph based in Cordoba, in Spain, setting up the great G 
golden caliphate uh, in Spain based upon the, his principal city of Cordoba. Uh, we see a major division, a political division in Islam. But we also see, and it's worth r reminding ourselves of this, uh, a very advanced civilization there in the caliphate of Cordoba. Uh, when, at a time uh, when, because we're talking about 735, uh, the dwellers in the British Isles are really living in quite primitive conditions. We see in Cordoba uh, lighting stretching for miles in the streets, a very advanced civilization. Uh, in, because Islam, whatever faults, uh, and of course we can see many uh, that uh, one might uh, uh, find within the bosom of Islam, also managed to absorb within it a great many of the ideas, both scientific and philosophical from those countries which had invaded from the Roman Empire even though it burnt the library at Alexandria nonetheless it acquired a lot of the knowledge architectural, scientific, uh, medicinal and, and advanced those ideas themselves and we begin to see uh, great Muslim philosophers doctors, scientists um, uh, following the example of the earlier civilization of Christian Rome uh, based in Constantinople and we see it particularly developing in this golden caliphate in Spain, but nonetheless the threat remains. In fact the, the Golden Caliphate began to develop more uh, an idea of living, um, coexisting with Christianity and with Judaism perhaps rather more than the Abbasids and particularly the later uh, rather more aggressive Turks not to say that the Abbasid Arabs weren't themselves aggressive, they were but the Turks had become a real serious threat to all uh, the its neighbour its neighbours and particularly of course Christianity. So even today of course if one visits Spain you can see evidence of this golden caliphate the, you know that the, the, there's now a common heritage and a recognition of the magnificence and beauty of what was um, achieved there but you, you have this steady rise um, and the different the divisions within Islam some of which we recognize the names mm. of some of these different groups right down to today uh, would also play their role as the as the story develops uh, with the ones named after um, the, the daughter of the prophet and so on so where does this take us as we are looking at it from the perspective of the holy places in Jerusalem and so on, these places which had been Christian and have now been uh, under Islam for, for a long while, although Christians are still able to visit there, they're still able to go there under, under certain conditions, but it's getting increasingly difficult. Yes, well when you, in the first flush of invasion, of course, uh, you then tend to see the sack of the cities invaded, you see the sack of Jerusalem, the holy places, the holy sepulchre itself, originally built of course by the Emperor Constantine, after whom Constantinople is named, uh, itself the Holy Sepulchre, attacked. Uh, but, but as the uh, Muslim um, caliphate settles in its, uh, in its kingdom, in its, in its, um, uh, its development, uh, it gets used to being the ruling power. It consolidates it, it begins, to, begins mm. to be a little bit more flexible about the, um, the advent of Christian pilgrims. And in those earlier times, uh, Christian pilgrims continued and... and to, to go to the Holy Land perhaps increased in their visits. Apart from anything else, of course, uh, the local Muslims profited from the, um, the visits by pilgrims who uh, brought with them, of course, trade, uh, commerce, which was not something that uh, uh, Muslims were by any means opposed to. Far from it, uh, they themselves set up great trade routes going right out to the east, um, perhaps even in some cases as far as certainly India and perhaps China. But we mustn't forget that the invasions continue. Uh, they, they fluctuate depending upon the particular Muslim ruler, whether he wishes to take a rather more aggressive stance, perhaps predicating himself upon the doctrines within the Quran of jihad, which we of course know about today because that, there's been a resurgence of the doctrine of jihad, the spreading of the, uh, of the religion of Islam by the sword, or whether they prefer to, to consolidate what they had, uh, to enjoy their dominions, rather than to engage in costly wars, which, with the best will in the world, is always going to be expensive in terms of manpower and of wealth. Um, so you see differences. You see, as I've said, in the, um, uh, the, the Golden Caliphate in, in Spain, uh, uh, there comes a time when they begin to feel that coexistence is, is perfectly uh, reasonable. 
uh, and even in the Abb- once the Abbasids begin to uh, consolidate themselves in, the, in Mesopotamia in the Middle East, they too uh, take a slightly more benign attitude than they had hitherto towards the um, uh, visiting Christian pilgrims. But we mustn't forget that the raids continue. And in 813, we see uh, the Muslim raiders attacking uh, Civita Vecchia, just outside Rome. We see in 838, they invade Marseille in, uh, in, in France, or the land of the Franks. Marseille, of course, is a very important city. This is where um, Christianity first comes, or just close to Marseille, to, the, to that part of France, of course, then under Roman rule, with St. Mary Magdalene, St. Lazarus. So it's a very important city as far as Christianity is concerned. And then finally we see in 846 and the Muslim raiders sail a fleet of ships from Africa up the Tiber River and attack the outlying areas around Ostia and Rome. Uh, some even manage to enter Rome and damage the churches of uh, St. Peter's Basilica and St. Paul. Uh, and <clears throat> they, they don't leave until the, the, the then ruling Pope, Leo IV, promises a yearly tribute of... 25,000 silver uh, crowns to the, to the raiders. And it is after that time that he builds a wall uh, to fend off further attacks. And this is as early as 846, the Leonine Wall is built. It doesn't stop there. We see in 859, Muslim invaders attack, attacking and capturing the Sicilian city of uh, uh, Castro Giovanni, slaughtering several thousand inhabitants. Whenever the Muslims decide to go on a raid, uh, they don't scruple at, uh, at uh, dealing with the inhabitants of the captured towns in that way uh, and of course enslaving the inhabitants because the Quran itself uh, doesn't teach against slavery it regards slavery as the practical result of conquest and so we see that time and time again and in, in 884 uh, we see the monastery of Monte Cassino famous monastery burnt to the ground by Muslim raiders. Um, this is the continuing theme that we see uh, throughout this period. Uh, we also see the beginnings y- yet further of further fissures and splits within the body of Islam itself. And we begin to see the, the advance uh, of the Turks far away in the east Uh, they themselves being pushed by Mongols behind them Um, fierce pagan tribes at this stage the Turks themselves are pagans they're not yet uh, Muslims and they begin to move into Mesopotamia and large portions of Persia conquering as they go Uh, at the same time we see in Egypt a new dynasty you mentioned them already the Fatimids uh, so that we begin to see a tripartite division of the Islamic territories the the uh, Abbasids in Mesopotamia, the Golden Caliphate, and then we see in Egypt the rise of the Fatimids, uh, a a sect or or a family in fact, uh, but with rather different views than some other parts of Islam. So while you've got all of this going on, and of course Europe is, is, is vulnerable in other ways, we, we know we already at this stage, we've also got the Viking raids in Northern Europe, particularly uh, around Ireland and the, the British Isles and so on. And then over to the east, it's still pagan. We haven't yet had Christianity brought uh, to the parts of Eastern Europe. We're still looking at paganism there. So Europe feels extremely vulnerable. When I say Europe, Christendom, I would say, because they didn't really consider themselves European, there was a strong sense that Christianity was in that sense a Middle Eastern religion and it wasn't a religion that, that, that belonged to or had even been fostered particularly by the European uh, peoples, but by essentially initially by peoples of the Middle East. So there was this great sense of threat of this new immensely strong religion which uh, then ceased to be new, it had just become not only immensely strong but by now consolidated and by now it really had charge of the holy places although Christians could visit there on pilgrimage and brought with them a certain trade and and prosperity. So initially, at at, at least, you've got this recognition of this apparently unstoppable thing, and then this real terror that they they raided coasts and captured children and so on. So you get, um, whilst the raids are still going on, uh, as it were, on the frontiers Mm. of Islam, within the core of Islam, there you get consolidation. So as as, as as you rightly point out, I don't know if you've said, the Christian pilgrims still managed to find their way through to the Holy Land, even though it's firmly in 
Muslim hands at this stage. But the, there's the subdivision of Islam, um, as with any empire, does of course cause some weakening. Um, we also see religious differences. The Umayyads, for example, rejected the prophecies of, of uh, Muhammad. Um, the Fatimids believed that they, as a family, descended from the daughter of Muhammad, Fatima. Fatima yes. um, the, the Abbasids themselves were now increasingly under threat from the Seljukian um, Turks. Mm. Uh, but nonetheless, we still see the raids going on. We see, uh, for example, in 9-11, um, the passes in right uh, up in the Alps between France and Italy are cut off by Muslim raiders so that the passage between the two countries is, uh, is effectively closed. This we is up in the Alps, in the, the, Alps the, yes. the, the passes through the mountains and yes. so by now in 9-11 we're in the beginning of the 10th uh, century so at that point even uh, Islam has reached the Alps which mm. um, the, the great yes, European mountains. I mean, it hasn't taken northern Italy or, or no. southern France but because it's taken Spain and because it's conquering well, oh, sorry, it's raiding all along the coast of Italy. Mm. It's, it's quite able to get up into the into passes the, into of the Alps and block yes. them off. It also, uh, by the year 920, reaches the city of Toulouse in France. Um, and in 961, um, we finally see uh, Abdul Rahman III succeeded by uh, Abdallah. Um, and Abdallah is, a, is back in the old mould of the aggressive. Uh, raiders, Muslim raiders. He is the caliph, again in the Golden Caliphate, but he is much more of an aggressive stance. He uh, kills many of his rivals, even his own family members, has them murdered, and captured Christians are decapitated on his order if they refuse to convert to Islam. So here we are right back again, it seems, to uh, the bad old days of a, a highly aggressive uh, phase of Islam. And then we see on the 11th of August, 9 97, um, Al-Mansur ibn Abi Ahmir, known to the Christians as Al-Mansur, uh, arrives in the city of Compostela uh, and burns it to the ground. A sacred city to Christians because that is of course where St. James the Great, the, uh, the um, patron saint of Spain, uh, was buried. Um, so uh, we, we, be, we begin to see uh, a reawakening of the aggressive spirit. Uh, of, uh, of Islam. It's never gone away completely, but um, we see periods of consolidation, periods where perhaps the uh, aggressive spirit uh, is exchanged for one of peaceful coexistence. Um, and, but then the Arabs themselves find that they are under threat from the East. And it is around about the year 1000, around about the same time when the Mojars are invading uh, Eastern Christian Europe, we see the rise of the Seljukian Turks, uh, a, a Turkish empire founded uh, by an Oguz Turkish bey uh, or chieftain uh, named Sozuk, uh, who comes from around the Caspian Sea area and, and sets up this great dynasty which is going to sweep uh, all before it, even uh, the Muslim Arabs. And although they begin as, as, as pagans, they themselves adopt the new religion uh, of Islam and carry on. Uh, the jihad uh, or the holy war uh, which the Arabs had earlier, earlier uh, themselves prosecuted uh, as if they were now the spearhead uh, of Islam and we see in the year uh, 1009 uh, sorry 1009 1009 the caliph al-Hakim bin Ami Allah founder of the a new sect the Druze sect uh, he is the sixth Fatimid caliph in Egypt. Uh, he orders the Holy Sepulchre and all Christian buildings in Jerusalem to be destroyed. So the great Holy Sepulchre, which has been there for, for seven or eight hundred years since the time, or seven hundred years since the time of uh, the Emperor Constantine, who built it on the site where his mother, uh, St. Helena, is said to have found the true cross, is burnt, destroyed by uh, the Muslim Druze caliph. Uh, and in 1012, the same Caliph al-Hakim orders the destruction of all Christian and Jewish houses of worship in his lands in Egypt and uh, further afield where the Fatimid uh, dynasty uh, holds sway. Here we see very much 
the aggressive phase once again uh, to the fore uh, and a great threat to the security uh, of the Christian holy places and of Christianity itself. And so any uh, Christian pilgrims there would, would have brought this news back but also would themselves have been threatened so the whole area is now uh, regarded as not one that can be in any sense accessible really by, by Christians mm. and they see that situation getting worse. Mm. Uh, we're now having the actual destruction of the Holy Sepulchre, the destruction of Jewish buildings, destruction of Christian buildings um, and still it goes on, it, they're still... Um, uh, well that's right and, and over, over in, uh, the, in Spain <coughs> The Berbers now decide to turn on their uh, Arab uh, masters. Uh, we see Berber leaders uh, capture parts of the Arab territory and eventually they end up capturing Cordoba itself, uh, ordering half the population, many of them Muslims, of course, most of them probably, to be executed. Of course, there would have been many Christian and Jewish slaves as well uh, in that city. Um, and we see that... Uh, this from the Caliphate of Cordoba um, in 1013, a year later, ruled by Suleiman, that the Jews are expelled from that city. Um, again, Islam, uh, following the example of uh, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, after he was unable to convert the Jews in Palestine, developed a great hostility to that people and, the, and that religion which uh, from peri periodically from time to time we see uh, in Islamic territories um, results in persecution. So we're seeing both Jews and Christians being persecuted there in uh, that part of the Muslim lands. So here we have it, the whole of the southern part of Europe constantly under threat. Spain taken, uh, the coast of Italy threatened and above all the Holy Land itself, the Holy Places. Uh, in the hands of, of Islam, uh, a period of consolidation and now another renewed period of persecution, and uh, persecution of the, of the holy places. And so the scene is, as it were, uh, building up to what he, we and history have come to call the First Crusade. But in a sense, um, the people then didn't know it was going to be called that, mm -hmm. and there had already been um, a great many battles of one kind and another, primarily won by Islam. Sometimes, I I indeed, we don't even know very much about the battles. They were simply acquiring territory. There's no evidence there was any terribly organized Christian response. There would have been skirmishes, but uh, incursions on the coast and so on seem to have uh, left people bewildered and uh, a sense of being undefended. There was no, at that point, apparently united uh, Christian response with, a, with an organized structure and armies and so on, only presumably um, uh, you know, localized people, uh, which in the days of poorer communications, would have, they would have felt very isolated. They would, and uh, the, once the Byzantine Empire began to feel the, the force of invasion, uh, whilst they retained some influence over the holy places, they, feeling their weakness, eventually allowed uh, the Franks uh, to, because the Frankish uh, people had by then long since been Christian, uh, they, of course, having been originally a barbarian invader of the Roman Empire, allowed them to take control of parts of the, ho the holy places in uh, the holy city of Jerusalem. And so you see a Frankish presence from, from quite early on. Uh, and they are tolerated by uh, various Islamic leaders and then they're persecuted and then we see the Holy Sepulchre burned to the ground. And in the 11th century we begin to see a renewed persecution of, uh, of, of Christians and we begin to see another move by Islam to move in on and invade Christian territory. So of course that makes those people living in or visiting the holy places that much more um, vulnerable. Now because pilgrims are travelling all those many miles across Europe to go to the holy places in the, the city of Jerusalem uh, we see the setting up of places within Jerusalem to care for the pilgrims the original hospital uh, and various other uh, establishments are set up around this time which subsequently begin as a hospital, begin as a place to care for visiting pilgrims. And from these early beginnings arises the original idea of at least one, if not more, of the Christian military orders of chivalry that are going, we're going to hear about 
uh, particularly the hospitalers, the Knights Hospitaller, who begin on this site of the very hospital, Pilgrim Hospital in Jerusalem, and who subsequently, beginning as nursing brothers, nursing brethren and sisters, subsequently find themselves enlisted as uh, for a kind of police force and then subsequently warriors to defend <coughs> the visiting pilgrims. As you see this increasing volatility of Islam, aggression by Islamic leaders, you see that there is a need for a defensive force, a fo strong, well-disciplined defensive force uh, in order to protect those pilgrims going and visiting the Holy Land and also <coughs> visiting the, uh, protecting those who live there uh, <coughs> and just as much and just as important defending the frontiers of a threatened, uh, once again threatened Christendom. And so the scene is set for the formation of these military religious orders. And we're going to be finding out more of them over the next uh, programmes. We've got the scene then on the brink of what uh, history has come to call the First Crusade. The first um, really organised way of defending Christendom against this incursion of Islam. And we've seen the, the building up of, Chris, of Islam with all its magnificence and its splendours and, and the threat also that it's opposed to Christendom. Stay with us then as we go into the next uh, program in this series on the military orders and the crusades. And next time we'll be looking at the Knights Templar and Hospitallers, the foundation and rise of these orders. <laughs>